to live and to love the gospel of the Lord. Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents an inspiring gospel reflection by Father Michael Sparrow. Father Michael is a Jesuit priest working as a writer and retreat master at the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House outside Chicago. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish but to fulfill. Amen, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commands will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Our readings today, both the reading from Paul's letter to the Corinthians as well as our Gospel that I just proclaimed, deal with law. Jesus says, I didn't come to break the law but I did come to fulfill it. St. Paul says, the spirit of the law is what gives life. The letter of the law kills. Jesus obviously was not obsessed with keeping the letter of the law while he was alive, walking the earth 2,000 years ago. Matter of fact, one of the major points of contention between him and the Pharisees is they saw him as a lawbreaker. Jesus was healing on the Sabbath. Jesus' disciples weren't washing their hands in the prescribed manner. Jesus wasn't wearing the religious garb of a Pharisee. Jesus didn't preach the way that the normal rabbis did. He didn't quote precedent. There were so many ways in which Jesus shook things up. Now we look back and we say, well, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is God. Of course, of course he does this. But place yourself in the position for just a moment of an observant Jew 2,000 years ago and you want to follow the laws. You want to follow your religious teachers. And the authoritative teachers were the, were the Pharisees. And the Jewish Sanhedrin was the high uh, ruling council. And the chief priest was, was the pope of the Jews. He was the legitimate authority. And Jesus comes along and he's shaking things up. Now even for those who believed in Jesus, he would say many things that they didn't understand. Even when Peter proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, he didn't understand what, what kind of a Messiah Jesus would mean. For the observant Jews, a Messiah meant that they were going to kick out the Romans, that the, the Davidic uh, uh, line would once again uh, come into legitimate rule. It was, a, it was a, going to be a Messiah of power and, and might. And Jesus said, no, no, that's not what I have in mind. He had to confront Peter to his face. Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking like God thinks. You're thinking like a human being. Think back on so much of Christian revelation is mired in obscurity. The Holy Spirit, the, the angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, are you willing to become the mother of the Messiah? And Mary says, how is this possible? And the answer is the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Oh, does that clear up everything? Does that make it really clear? Well, how come Joseph didn't get the memo? Because Joseph was going to divorce Mary. My point is that to believe in God's grace is to live with ambiguity. 
those who were following Jesus, heard him say, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. A huge split within the disciples that were following Jesus. Because what does that mean? Is it cannibalism? Is Jesus going to take his own life? What, 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 what on earth is he talking about? It wouldn't be much later to the end of his life at the Last Supper where Jesus would say, this is my body, this is my blood, when taking the, the sacred elements of bread and wine. But his disciples had to live with that ambiguity of saying, he said this, but I don't, I don't have any idea what he's talking about. They were asked to accept it in faith. So Jesus dies and is risen and the Holy Spirit comes. And now everything is clear, right? No. With the early disciples, when the Gentiles came into the early community, did they have to follow the Mosaic law or not? To be a Jew meant, to be a Jewish man, meant to be circumcised. To be an observant Jew meant to follow the Mosaic law. The Gentiles are coming in. Do they have to follow the Mosaic law? Do they have to be circumcised? Major controversy within the early Christian community. Now we read these texts and we say, well, they had the Council of Jerusalem and they, but they struggled with this for years. This wasn't easily, easily resolved. We come to our point, we, we come to our point in history, and we recognize that all of these controversies of the past are past, and everything is clear today, right? Because we know exactly what the Lord is asking of us. There's no controversies within the church, there's no division. We... No, we, like those who have gone before us, are mired in ambiguity and controversy. It's the nature of living the human condition that only gradually does truth become revealed. Only gradually do we begin to understand what it is that God is asking of us. One of the major controversies that the bishops are struggling with right now is... Can President Biden receive Holy Communion? There isn't a bishop in the United States who isn't against abortion. A hundred percent of the bishops in the United States are against abortion. And there isn't a single bishop who's pro-choice. But we have, for only the second time in American history, a Catholic, pres a Catholic president but President Biden is pro-choice. Personally, he says, I'm against abortion, but I'm not going to force my beliefs on others. I'm going to allow women to make that choice. That goes against Catholic teaching. And the bishops are divided as to whether they can give him Holy Communion or not. They're split right down the middle in that regard. Now, that's very frustrating, and I was talking to a very holy deacon just the other day, and he said, Father Michael, the people are confused. We need clarity on this issue. The bishops have to, have to, have to decide this and be, and be clear. And he was quite, quite clear in his opinion in that regard. Is President Biden should not be allowed to receive communion because he's not following church teaching. But the bishops are divided on that. Not because they're divided on the issue of abortion. There's, there's, there's no controversy there. But when you have a president who is pro-choice, can he legitimately receive Holy Communion or not? Now let me cite an example in history that I, I think is extremely illuminating in this regard. In the 14th century, in the 1300s, the papacy had moved from Italy, from, from Rome, to Avignon for political reasons. And for 70 years, 70 years, the Pope was in Avignon. That means an entire generation of Catholic Christians grew up only knowing that the Pope was in Avignon, France. They would have no memory 
of the fact that the Pope was, used to be in Rome. No experience of, of that within their lifetime. And there were two great saints who butted heads over this issue. St. Catherine of Siena and St. Vincent Fair. They were contemporaries. They were born within three years of each other. Catherine of Siena was born in uh, Siena, Italy in 1347. St. Vincent Fair was born in Spain in 1350. They were both Dominicans. Vincent Fair was a priest but and a, and a Dominican. St. Catherine of Siena was a laywoman, but she was a, a third order Dominican. Vincent Fair was a fantastic preacher. He worked miracles. He was a healer. He was universally acknowledged as a holy man of God, filled with religious zeals. He performed miracles. Catherine of Siena, she was a stigmatist. She was tremendously devoted to the passion of Christ and would later be declared a doctor of the church. Now, what's the controversy? Inspired by what she believed was the Holy Spirit, she came to the Pope in Avignon and said, Jesus wants you to move back to Rome. He believed her, he moved back to Rome. Vincent Fair didn't believe that Catherine was right, and he supported another pope who continued to live in Avignon. And so you've got two popes, and eventually you've got three popes, each claiming to be the legitimate pope, and you've got two saints, one who's siding with the pope who's moved back to Rome, and the other saint who's siding with the one who's living in Avignon, France. How long did this controversy last? 39 years. From the years 1378 to 1470, 1417, it's the great Western schism. 39 years, Catholics are wondering, who's the Pope? You don't, you don't even know who the Pope is for 39 years. Can you imagine living with that ambiguity and with that struggle that long? And you've got saints, not heretics. You've got saints saying the Pope is in Avignon. You've got a saint saying the Pope is in, is in Italy. Catherine of Siena died two years after the Pope, which history looks back and says the laywoman, Catherine of Siena was right, the priest was wrong. That's the judgment of history. But they're both saints. They're both saints. Catherine of Siena died two years after she convinced the Pope to live, to, to move back to Rome. Vincent Fair struggled through the entire controversy of 39 years. And he would write that it so distressed him physically and mentally that it broke his mental health and his physical health. He died two years after the controversy was resolved in the year 1419. What does this teach us? Is that holiness is deeper and broader and more profound than being right. You can be wrong on a very important issue like who is the Pope and still be a saint. And the opposite is true. You can be right on a theological issue and still be mired in sin because you're filled with pride or arrogance or a spirit of bitterness. Holiness is deeper and broader and more profound than being right. Let's acknowledge that we Americans right now are obsessed with being right. We need to become more passionate about holiness and not simply about being on the right side of a political theological issue. I'm not saying that those issues aren't important. And Catherine of Siena and Vincent Fair butted heads and they both argued passionately for what they believed was right. 
But my point is that truth is only gradually revealed. And we live mired in controversy, and that is the human condition. And we have a whole host of issues right now where there's great confusion. A number of years ago, Pope Francis, in his encyclical on marriage, said, I think there should be a pathway for divorced and remarried Catholics who have not received an annulment, who are living in a stable relationship, there should be a pathway for them to be able to receive Holy Communion. Cardinals and bishops said, heresy, accusing the Pope, you're a heretic, you're breaking with Catholic doctrine, you can't do that. That issue is still unresolved. Can gay couples living together have their relationship blessed? The Vatican came out recently and said no. German bishops and German priests broke with the ranks of the Vatican on that and decided to bless civil unions of gay couples. I had a man come to me not so long ago and said, Father, what do I do? My daughter, who is 13 years old, claims that she's transgender and she no longer wants to be called by her baptized name. What do I do, Father? Does America suffer from systemic racism like President Biden recently declared? Is critical race theory legitimate? How do we deal with our, with our racial injustices of the past? How do we deal with the fact that, we, that the American government broke virtually every treaty they made with the Native Americans? And there's a pipeline that's going right through Native soils right now that were promised to the Native Americans. Is it legitimate to take the vaccine or not because it was tainted with abortion early on in, in the development? These are just few of the issues that are swirling around in our society today, and there's no shortage of opinions, and I'm not going to resolve these in the, in the homily, but my point is this. We want clarity. We want clear answers. And some of us are attracted to those who say, this is the truth. And these other people, they're heretics, they're liars, they're scumbags. There's a certain attractiveness to saying this is the truth. Because we all want clarity. I want clarity as much as you. But I cite these examples from history to say that we are not the first, we are not the last, and in a sense, every age struggles to say, what is the Holy Spirit asking of us? Let me close with this quote from the Jesuit priest, Father Teilhard de Chardin. He was a paleontologist. He worked as part of the team that discovered Peking man. He was a scientist, anthropologist, Mystic, poet, philosopher, theologian. He died in, he was originally from France. He died in New York City in 1955. His writings were originally put on the index of forbidden books by the Vatican. And then later he was exonerated and he's seen as one of the great prophets of the 20th century. Here's what Chardin wrote. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We would like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that it is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. 
Your ideas mature gradually. Let them grow. Let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstance acting on your own goodwill will make of you tomorrow. Only God can say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. And accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. Amen? Amen. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand. Spirit of Jesus, open our hearts to live and to love the gospel.